Great. So that's good to go. And the clicker is so if you want to move it backwards and forwards, you just do that. And if you want to use this, so yeah, that's okay. okay. <laughs> Excellent. I always prefer to point. Sure. I, I, yeah. to introduce our next speaker. And our next speaker is Professor Jim Mallory from uh, Queen's University, Belfast, uh, who has written a wonderful book called The Origins of the Irish and has spent much of his career researching uh, migrations into and out of Ireland from the earliest times imaginable. And that's quite a long time ago. So uh, here to talk to us about the origins of the Irish, please give a welcome for Professor Jim Mallory. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, as just mentioned, in 2013, I published a book called The Origins of the, of the Irish, uh, asking the critical question of where do these guys come from? And in the book, you needed, besides them, uh, you need sort of a census date for a definition of Irish, because obviously you couldn't play with the thing, anybody born in Ireland, Today, that would take me to pretty well every country in the world, drawing arrows and things like that. So I selected, actually, an archetypal Irishman on the border between pseudo-history and history, that is Nile of the Nine Hostages, reputed to live around the fifth century. Many dynasties trace their, their ancestry back to him. Uh, he was early enough, I felt, to avoid historical immigrants, uh, that is, people whom you would have then said, well, they weren't really Irish, they were actually Normans or Vikings or something like that, but also at least uh, at a period in which the Irish language was known to be spoken in Ireland, uh, which is going to be a critical point, as you'll see as I go through this lecture. And if you consider the past of Ireland, what I was trying to avoid uh, were all the historical immigrations, be it Vikings, Normans, the Gallic Lee, Plantation, Huguenot, and so forth. From this, you can obviously see from the historical period that Ireland is a com was a composite of a series of, of migrations uh, and the population continually being increased and diversified by later comers, such as myself. Uh, if we go to the prehistoric period, even though they're going to be anonymous, the archaeologists can recognize in the uh, archaeological record various periods in which we believe there at least is a case, sometimes abs with absolute certainty, other cases, well, possibility of population migrations into Ireland. From the initial settlement of Ireland in the early Mesolithic, uh, at around 8000 BC, uh, all the way up to the Romano-British period, in which we find Romano-British material in Ireland and clear instances of at least occasionally people coming across and being buried in Ireland. So prehistoric Ireland also is probably a composite of different migrations. Now, we could go through virtually all of these and talk how you build ultimately an Irish identity, but. For this lecture, I only want to focus on one main thing for me, and that is how and when did the Irish language come to Ireland? Uh, if you've read my book, you know that I, I played a bit of a game here. Anybody that I couldn't be sure spoke Irish, I called an Irelander, <laughs> uh, sort of a neutral German term. Uh, for a person who occupies the country, which would later come to adopt the Irish language. Now, you may ask the question, is the language really that important? And needless to say, <laughs> despite my accent, uh, I didn't just float up the lagging in a bubble and I'm not going to walk into that trap. Uh, I'll simply do this as a rhetorical question. Is language important? Well, do you believe that this monument is really a, 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 an example, the epitome of English craftsmanship? Uh, Stonehenge. And if I use the word English in this case, 
if you have any linguistic or historical sense to yourself whatsoever, you should probably be choking on it because this was erected at least two and a half thousand years before Horsa, Hengist, and the rest of the Anglo-Saxons brought the English language to England. Therefore, the monument, if, if I'm trying to define it with an English thing, uh, as, as a, a linguistic term, it's completely inappropriate. And we have to ask ourselves the questions about the past and the use of, of ethnic terms, uh, particularly when they also imply perhaps a, a linguistic uh, identity as well. So we begin with Irish, and as everybody knows, it is one of the Celtic languages. Uh, in the British Isles, they are divided into two groups, the Gaelic or Gaelic group, which is Irish, Scots, and Manx, and the Bretonic group, uh, which would be Welsh, Cornish, and Breton, which is a result of an immigration from southern Britain uh, to, uh, uh, to France. And the continental Celtic languages, and that would be Gaulish, which occupied most of, of, of France, Lepontic, a Celtic language spoken in northern Italy in the vicinity of Milan, and a very large proportion of the Iberian Peninsula, which also spoke a Celtic language. Now, the thing about this is, is that we have to see this in even a wider perspective. And I'm going to use a wider perspective in this lecture for reasons that will become quite transparent later on. Uh, think of 9th century Ireland. And here's a depiction of an Irish warrior and Irish monks. And move four and a half thousand miles to the east, to the western province of China, in Xinjiang. And there you would also find warriors, so decorated here on cave paintings, and monks, not Christian, but Buddhist. And these people are Tokarians. That would be the, the name we, we traditionally give to them. And if you compared Old Irish, earliest evidence for the Irish language, uh, and Tokarian B, you don't have to be a linguist to see similarities in some of these basic, basic words. And the similarities are because they both belong to the same ultimate language family. The Indo-European language family that stretches on the west from Ireland to the east to Korean in Eastern China, and all of the languages in between. Uh, and this is simply a general diversified map of the Indo-European languages. Uh, you can put the languages into a family tree, for example, and see the Celtic languages here, then the Italic languages, which would be Latin, and the descendants of Latin, all the Romance languages, the Germanic languages, which would include English, and as long as we are in Ireland, the Baltic languages, which would include Lithuanian, the Slavic languages, which would include Polish, uh, and certainly for carryouts and finer restaurants, <laughs> Indo-Iranian languages, which would include the ancient languages of Sanskrit, uh, or the ancient languages of Old Persian, and needless to say, all of their modern descendants. And all of these are members of the Indo-European language family that go back to a common ancestor. <coughs> Whoop, sorry. Whoop. And this means the origins of the Irish in time and space is to some, again, is to some extent is going to be mitigated by the position of Celtic and its origins in time and space. And Celtic is being part of the greater story of the expansion of the Indo-European language family. And as I indicate here, there are two major competing models of Indo-European origins and dispersals. There are a lot more than two, but we'll stick with two major competing ones. One, sometimes called the early farming dispersal hypothesis or the Anatolian uh, homeland hypothesis, uh, particularly championed by uh, Colin Renfrew believes that the Indo-European languages began in Anatolia. That's the fancy ancient name for Turkey. Uh, Anatolia is associated with the spread of farming, uh, the beginning of the Neolithic economy, to Europe. And in this particular argument, farming and the spread of farming is looked upon 
as the only event sufficiently large, sufficiently great, important, uh, to explain the spread of a language family as large as Indo-European. And the logic of this is, is fairly transparent. Before farming, you had hunter-gatherers who would there be basically sparse on the landscape because the carrying capacity for hunter-gatherers is much, much lower than it is for farmers. Once farming began, you got a lot larger families and you got an explosion of population growth. So farmers could always outcompete hunter-gatherers and therefore the expansion of farming is a, basically a population spread and a population uh, increase. And it is put into the context of a number of other major language families of Eurasia and Africa that have also been attributed to, to the spread of agriculture. So basically, an Anatolian homeland, basically uh, argued to be sort of a general area uh, between Central Anatolia and Eastern Anatolia, saw Indo-European languages spread to the east, the Indo-Iranian languages, for example, and the European languages spreading to the west. And farming spread across Europe, and we're, we're doing this from the mind's eye of somebody in Ireland, by the way of two different routes, one of them from Anatolia into the Balkans and then along the Danubian drainage. So that's the northern arrow that's pointing towards Ireland. It leaves Anatolia about 7,000 BC and the farmers get to Britain and Ireland about 4,000 BC. The other route is across the Mediterranean, across the central Mediterranean, then the western Mediterranean, and then around and coming up Atlantic Europe towards Ireland at about the same period as the, as the northern route. Oop. Oh, it's bloody hell. <laughs> Just press it again. And there we go then. There we go. The second model, the so-called step model, uh, most prominently championed by Maria Gimbutas, argues that the great event was not farming, but the great event was the expansion of a mobile pastoralist society that occupied the area north of the Black and Caspian Seas. This is the area of the Ukraine and South Russia. Uh, it argued that this was a later phenomenon occurring about 4,500 to 3,000 BC or so, and that this region is the region that best accommodates the type of society that linguists seem to recover from comparing the Indo-European languages, which suggests that they had the horse, they had, domestic, uh, they had wheeled vehicles, um, and, and a few other items. And therefore, we have a Pontic Caspian uh, Indo-European homeland located, as you see in the upper picture, that over a period of around 45 to 3,000 BC is argued to have expanded right across Europe to the Atlantic and to the British Isles and as well to the, to the east, uh, to uh, India and uh, also into to eastern China, uh, carrying wheeled vehicles, domestic horse and a pastoral economy. And what are the cultures? cultures? major cultures of this expansion is the Yamnaya culture that dates to around just before 3000 BC, uh, well known for having burials with uh, wheeled vehicles, for example, and exploitation of, of domestic horses. Now, when I wrote my book in 2013, I tried to indicate a hit list of potential invasions that may have occurred throughout Irish uh, prehistory, from the early Mesolithic uh, down to the Romano-British period. And the more serious invasions or migrations are indicated there in red. So you would have got the early Mesolithic, the initial settlement of Ireland, the early Neolithic, the bringing of farming, grooved where uh, a period around 3000 BC, 
when a basically a cultural horizon that may very well have emanated uh, in Northern Scotland, spread right across Britain and Ireland. The Beakers, who we'll hear much more about uh, a little bit later on. Uh, the Laten, the Iron Age culture that is associated with Celtic art, if you can use that word, on the continent. And then, of course, the Romano-British. And if you put these into the context of these Indo-European homeland theories, then the, the Neolithic theory uh, would have Irish or the ancestor of Irish coming in in the early Neolithic and the step hypothesis <clears throat> a bit vaguer as to precisely when, but it would have begun maybe as early as the Beakers or any time after the Beakers at, at around 2500 BC. Well, when I was writing the book, it was against the background of the disputed genetic origins of the Irish. Uh, every few years, newspapers, magazines came out with new origins for the Irish, as you can see. Irish eyes are English, not Celtic. Uh, it has the same genes as the next island, therefore nothing special about that. No, said the French, as you can see there, the Irish come from the Levant. They're coming from the Near East. Bullshit, says the independent. <laughs> the Celts are descended from Spanish fishermen, study finds. And, you know, there's a plethora of stuff based on taking a look at modern DNA. And so I go into writing my chapter of, of, on the evidence of genetics, genes, blood types, and things like that. Uh, and this is basically what I was operating with. We, we knew the main... Uh, I'm going to just deal with Y chromosomes. I'm not going to make it any more complicated than that. But the Y chromosomes, by and large, it was seen that we've got maybe two different origins for the primary Y chromosomes that are found among the population of, of Ireland today, among males. Uh, I've listed the, uh, uh, the ones that were regarded as indigenous to Europe and believed to have spread after the last ice age from Spain and southern France as human populations filled up northwest Europe when the ice sheets had retreated. And then in red, you're given the few Y uh, chromosome haplogroups that were basically associated with the Near East or believed to be associated with the Near East that indicated farming. So what you basically got, if you were looking at the modern DNA, and it was being back projected uh, into Irish history, is that the initial settled settlers brought in the basic DNA of the modern Irish population. And it was augmented somewhat during the early Neolithic, about 4000 BC, by farmers whose ultimate origin was in the Near East. And this would therefore give you a story that ran something like this. 95% of the modern Irish population are descended from original colonists who spread from the glacial refuges. About 5% carry the genes of farmer colonists who spread from the Near East at about 4000 BC. And there was minimal or no evidence for any migrations during the Bronze and Iron Ages, according to the evidence of genetics on the Y chromosome. <clears throat> and therefore, you would see maps that would easily you know, explain what was going on in Ireland. Stephen Oppenheimer's book on the origins of the British, for example, shows you the spread of uh, uh, R1b, the main Y chromosome among males in Ireland. Uh, as a generalized expansion right across Northwest Europe, or the National Geographic in the same year as I was producing uh, uh, the book, showing you that the population of County Mayo overwhelmingly descended uh, from uh, Mesolithic or Neolithic people, about 98, uh, sorry, 88%, and about 12% from you know, later incomers. Twenty seventeen, four years later, they decided to do a smaller 
fun-sized paperback edition of The Origins of the Irish, and they allowed me 4,000 extra words to be tagged in at the end, in which I had to explain why the chapter I wrote in 2013 was absolute shite <laughs> and get away with it. <laughs> and so, four years in DNA is a long, long time. Uh, so, what has happened since then, in 2015, uh, is the publication of the first bit of ancient DNA from Ireland. Uh, it has the burial, uh, the DNA came from one individual from the Neolithic and three from the early Bronze Age. The Neolithic burial is an old excavation, if you want to call it an excavation, at uh, Ballynahattie, that's the Giant's Ring, outside of the, the, the Giant's Ring, uh, a tomb long since has disappeared, reported on in the first series of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology by none other than Robert McAdam, the founder of the journal uh, himself. Uh, and the bones had still been preserved. She dates to uh, around 3000 BC, but before that, her mitochondrial DNA indicates that her background is Mediterranean and that ultimately from the Near East. Genetically, she would be most similar to modern Sardinians, and Sardinians are basically regarded almost as the gold standard of what the remnants or the relics of Near Eastern farmers uh, would appear, appear like. So I give you a picture of a Sardinian uh, there, there below. And so it would suggest that the first farmers in Ireland came up along the Atlantic from the Mediterranean and ultimately from the Near East and had the genes for dark brown hair and eyes. So that's sort of what your, your earliest Neolithic uh, uh, Irelanders would look like. This would then suggest that the Neolithic route to Ireland on this sample of one, but it is actually, it is actually confirmed by other studies uh, in between, uh, makes this still the, the, the preferred route, uh, was the, the Mediterranean route rather than the Balkan Danubian route. Uh, this would take archeologists to some extent by surprise uh, because the, the Balkan Danubian one in some ways is actually closer culturally. That, but we'll go, we'll go with the DNA here. Now, if you, you accept this, then you are looking to the background of the early Neolithic settlement, genetically in archeology, span uh, to the central and west Mediterranean. Archeologically, this belongs to what is known as the cardial culture, named because they use a, a cardial shell to decorate their pottery. And it involved farmy, farmer colonists moving along the coastal areas uh, from uh, the former Yugoslavia, along the Italian, Italic coast, uh, across the, all the islands of the central and west Mediterranean, uh, all the way as far as Iberia, and then all the way up around the Atlantic. And the interesting thing about this is that linguistically, when we get our earliest written records from this area, it is the one area of Europe where we seem to be finding relic non-Indo-European languages. One of them still survives, that is Basque, but it was known to the ancient Romans as Aquitanian, uh, north of the Pyrenees in southern France. Uh, it's clearly, Aquitania is clearly just simply an early form of, of Basque. Uh, all along the shores of, of the, the eastern shores of, of Spain, we have texts in Iberian, clearly a non-Indo-European language. Uh, we have some still relics in, in, in uh, Italian inscriptions. And in Sardinia, this is, remember, our, our gold standard for, for Near Eastern, we have the remnants of what is normally called Paleo-Sardo, 
And if we take a look at Sardinian linguistic history, for example, uh, starting most recently, it was only in 238 BC that the Romans conquered Sardinia and introduced the Indo-European language of Latin. Before that, during the Iron Age, we know that Phoenicians and Carthaginians had established colonies there, and they had introduced their own language, which is a Semitic language, still survives in Malta, that's Maltese. Uh, this had very little impact, however, on later Sardinian language and on its place names. But if you look at the Sardinian language and its place names, it contains clearly an element of a non-Indo-European language. Some argue that it has elements that we could also find in Iberian and Basque. And the general theory proposed is that as Sardinia did not really have any Mesolithic population before farming, that it was settled, it was filled by farmers, and the so-called non-Indo-European elements that we're finding are relics of the original farming language that spread from the Near East across uh, uh, the Mediterranean. So, in this area where we have associated with the cardio culture, a series of non-Indo-European languages. And it's then argued that the Indo-European languages come later, such as Celtic or in Portugal, Lusitanian. Oops, sorry. And if you follow the logic then, the Irish first farmers should have introduced a non-Indo-European language related to the languages that we are finding in the Mediterranean that managed to survive up until the Iron Age. That means they would not have been introducing the Irish language. And so if I take a monument like Newgrange and say a monument of Irish craftsmanship, and if I mean Irish in the linguistic sense, I'm afraid that the logic I've given to you means that if someone dropped one of those large quartzite stones on your foot while they were building the thing, it is highly unlikely that they would have said Tabron Orum or Gamaleskal or something like that. They would not have been speaking Irish, a Celtic. It would have been done in a non-Indo-European language. So what about the second theory? The second theory is the uh, step hypothesis and that intersects earliest with the beakers. The beaker culture is an enormous cultural phenomenon. It expect, goes actually beyond some of the colored areas of this map from southern Scandinavia all the way to North Africa. It goes from the far west of both Ireland and Iberia as far east as, as Hungary. And it is primarily known and called the beaker culture from the shape of its vessels. It is also associated with things such as barbed and tanged arrowheads, so-called wrist bracers for archers, uh, copper daggers, sometimes the introduction of copper metallurgy, uh, and copper axes. Now, when I wrote my book, I went through the history of beaker studies in, in Ireland, uh, and <clears throat> I talked about how R.A.S. McAllister, back in 1949, came up with a fairly lurid description of their impact on Irish society. The beakers exterminated the men, or at least reduced them to slavery. As for the women, they met the usual fate of women in warfare. To every man a damsel or two, as the savage old Hebrew pain expresses it. It was the only catastrophe of ancient times subversive enough to have affected such a complete change of language. So as you can see, McAllister, who was also a linguist, believed that the Beaker Horizon represented a massive migration, an invasion of Ireland, that brought the Irish language. And I held this up as the type of bizarre nonsense that they were writing back then, because in the milieu in which I was writing, if we go to the standard textbook, of Irish archaeology by John uh, Waddell, for example, will read about the hypothesis of a distinct population group, the Beaker folk, has been replaced. By and large, invasion was out. You can have a handful of people come in. You do not have invaders anymore. Or Alistair Moffat's description in Scotland, 
regarding invasions, this interpretation is now largely discredited. Or we can take Heath's on Britain. The idea of a beaker invasion is now rightly treated with scant respect. And today, the concept is largely defunct with few, if any, archeologists continuing to believe in it. So, beaker folk, beaker invasion had been completely replaced among archeology span discourse. I came through my beaker chapter saying, I still think there was some evidence for you know, population movement in, 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 in the beaker period. It was not my prime idea over to suggest that this is where the uh, 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 Irish came in. Okay, we have ancient DNA from three male burials uh, discovered when expanding a, uh, extending a car park on a pub on Rathlin Island. They date to about 2000 BC. They were associated with food vessels. This is a sort of a later descendant of the beaker culture, but related to it. The individuals had light hair and brown eyes. Looking at their Y chromosome, it's good old R1B, uh, M529, I also give you your mitochondrial DNA there. Uh, two of them had the mitochondrial DNA of what we'll call indigenous Europeans, goes back to the Paleolithic or Mesolithic, and one of them had Near Eastern that had been picked up along the way. Where else can we find this in the ancient DNA record earlier? Kvalinsk is a cemetery on the middle Volga River. This is a burial here from the Copper Age. Uh, copper occurs here much earlier, and he has got precisely the same ancient DNA type as you're finding in Ireland. And two major studies in 2015 came to the conclusion on the basis of large surveys of ancient DNA from Central Europe, from Russia to Ukraine, and further east that sometime at least before 3000 BC, that Yamnaya culture, or the culture earlier than that, spread from the Black Sea region, and the Caspian region, both westwards into Europe and eastwards into Asia. In terms of the ones who came westward into Europe, uh, they came into the area of the Corded Ware culture, an enormous culture, and of the samples there, at least 70% carried the genes of steppe ancestry that they, they had brought there. And that steppe ancestry continued not only in the corded ware culture, but if you look over here, into the following bell beaker culture as well. So what you have here is a corded ware culture, and I give you a map to show you all the way from the Netherlands actually to the Ural Mountains. Uh, and this is an area that linguists would have generally been comfortable of saying, this is probably where the ancestors of the Germanic, the Baltic, and the Slavic speaking peoples came from. And we also find the R1B among the beakers of Northern Europe, not of Southern, but in Northern Europe, and I've sort of indicated the distributions there, uh, as south, far south actually as Northern, you know, as France, uh, uh, Germany, uh, the Netherlands in particular, uh, and Britain, and now in Ireland. So, the ancient DNA tells an entirely different story that I gave, that I gave initially. What it suggests is that the early and later Mesolithic was probably occupied <coughs> by a certain number of, of Y chromosome haplogroups. Uh, then we have our Neolithic, and that does represent another migration from the Near East. But the R1b, which had originally been imagined to have begun in the early Mesolithic in Ireland, does not appear in Ireland until the Beakers and it runs from then onwards. And so, the new history based on ancient DNA is that among the modern population, about 12% are derived from original colonists <coughs> who spread from these glacial refuges uh, uh, when the, the ice sheets retreated. About 
of Irish males come from farmer colonists who spread from the Near East, bringing agriculture to Ireland at around 4,000 BC. And 84% of Irish males are descendants of this movement of bigger populations into Ireland at around 2300 BC that genetically transformed clearly the Irish male population. Now, one of the things you might ask is, did it really, was it a sudden event or was it simply a migration stream? That is, at around 2400 BC, did we begin to get some R1B and that because anybody coming to Ireland is going to have to be coming from continental Europe, the direction of R1B, they're going to be carrying R1B in the, with them as well. And therefore, over time, Ireland has gradually developed and built up uh, a population uh, of R1B carriers. <clears throat> well, that would seem to be the most logical. However, <laughs> in a publication just last year on the Beaker culture, it, uh, looking at Britain, where they've collected considerably more ancient DNA evidence, it looks so far as they can tell, that at around 2400 BC, before the beakers hit Britain, there was no R1B, and within 400 years, something like 93% of the males were R1B. And that is indeed an incredibly rapid cultural and genetic transformation. And if you take a look at the British beakers, their ancient DNA, the, the main segment here, red means beaker and blue means Neolithic. By and large, we're dealing with a population that is either purely continental and carrying the step genes in with them, uh, or as you can see, a little bit of, of, of picking up of, of Neolithic genes along the way. And in a general scope right across Europe, the green that you see there is the step gene. Uh, you see it on the, the left there uh, in Samara. This is in Russia uh, and the Amnaya culture and then the Corded Ware culture. And it goes right over to the beakers. And so you see it not in Southern Europe or just barely. There's about two of them known from Copper Age uh, uh, Spain, but the rest fairly uniform right across Britain the Netherlands, and according to the evidence that we have so far, more than likely Ireland. I apologize, R.A.S. McAllister. <laughs> I may have taken the piss out of you in 2013, but the bloody geneticists have come back. <laughs> and they're pretty well saying exactly what you were saying uh, in 1949, which is uh, a pretty remarkable thing. That's the joy of all of this. So, <clears throat> is this the conclusion? The Irish language arrived in Ireland around 2300 BC. So you can forget ideas that they came over 300 BC and things like that. Well, <laughs> I've always found that any problem, if you look at it just the right way, is even more complicated than you thought it was. Uh, and so, some further comments then, because she has not yet sung. <clears throat> First, some really big problems about this story, indicating that it's not all over. We had, we have a model now that suggests that around 3000 BC, if uh, family DNA were going out there and measuring DNA, 100% of the population would either be carrying local Mesolithic DNA from the original settlement of, of Western Europe or Mediterranean farmer genes. Ireland filled up during the Neolithic. Its population increased. It built its monuments. It settled. It cleared the landscape, the whole thing. Logic and logistics would have basically uh, predicted that no migration after 3000 BC should have been anywhere near as large 
as the host population of Ireland at the end of the Neolithic. It should have been, you know, much less. It's going to be a minor group of plantation or something like that. But if you take a look at modern Ireland, according to DNA, only about 15% is local Mesolithic and Mediterranean farmer genes, and 85% comes from steppe or Central European genes. Well, you've got the, the Macalester, you know, description, or if you go on to Eupedia, you can find this taken even further. Technologically superior Celtic warriors equipped with bronze weapons and riding on horses massacred or enslaved indigenous men while taking their women, or they established a ruling elite that passed on more Y chromosomes through sustained polygamy over many centuries. Really? Well, it wasn't quite like that. We can do illustrations of Beaker Bowman because they clearly were very much into the idea of archery. Uh, we find full archery kits routinely in male burials. But if you wanted to sit there and contrast the Neolithic with the Beaker period, well, during the Neolithic, if they wanted to kill you from afar, they could, well, they had javelins, but they could also use arrows. And throughout the, most of the Neolithic, it would have been uh, lozenge-shaped arrows that you see there. By the grooved wear, the final period, uh, we have what we call petite tranche derivatives. Uh, in any event, there is evidence, be it in Britain or on the continent, of all of these found in human beings as a cause of death, so we know that they could be used in warfare as well as in hunting. Uh, for the Beaker period, uh, we have abundant evidence of these barbed and tanned arrowheads. Barbed and tanned arrowheads also, of course, clearly found in individuals and used as weapons. So, you've got a standoff. You've got a hundred beakers fighting up against a hundred locals. Barbed and tanged arrowheads are not weapons of mass destruction when the other guy is firing arrows back at you. And as for the only other type of weapon, you have copper axes, uh, which will be gradually introduced over the course of the, of the beaker period in Ireland and the development of, of copper metallurgy. Yes, being hit over the head in close combat with a copper axe would certainly do a lot of damage, kill you, etc. Obviously, however, not killing you really any much better than being clubbed over the head with a polished stone axe from the Neolithic. In short, it's awfully difficult to see weapon superiority between the beakers and the population they came in and supposedly wiped out at least in terms of males. Also, we don't have any evidence, certain evidence of the horse in Ireland until about 1000 BC, not at the time of the beakers. So, what happened to the native male population in Ireland? How were the more numerous native males deselected from the breeding population? This is an absolute key question. How is it we try to solve it? These are the suggestions. Selective slaughter of local male population. Well, needless to say, we don't have any archaeological evidence for death pits of local males filled with barbed and tanged arrowheads or heads bashed in with copper axes. Uh, nor is it easy to understand why they would let themselves be, be wiped out like this way. A second is that there is evidence in the corded ware culture that the steppe populations introduced, or at least were familiar with a pestis uh, virus, that is, they had the plague virus. And consequently, they may have introduced uh, uh, the debilitating disease uh, in areas that they spread. Uh, this could reduce the local population. However, the scenario we're dealing with here wants to reduce the males and not the females. And so if they were introducing plague, they should have wiped out a considerable portion of the entire Irish population. The third is that there was some form of social selection by local female populations 
who no longer thought the Mediterranean look was cool, and one of these guys with lighter colored hair. Uh, and therefore, this was the, the selection. Basically, this means we really have no idea why this genetic transformation was so successful in Ireland. From an archaeological point of view, we can't see it on the ground. We, we never saw this invasion coming. And, what, and once the geneticists put it on our plates, we can't quite see how they carried it off in the first place. Now, the language problem. There's still a language problem there as well. Our earliest evidence for uh, Irish in Ireland is the, the Almstones, <coughs> which date from, let's say, 400 AD onwards. Our earliest evidence for Celtic languages of the continent, and I'll choose Gaulish here, uh, dates in the, the first centuries uh, uh, BC. There's er, even some earlier evidence, arguably, uh, in, in, uh, in northern Italy, but we've got far more evidence here in, uh, uh, in, in France. Generally, linguists, before the genetic evidence was brought in here, believes that the Celtic languages, their basic split up into their different groups occurred traditionally maybe around 1000 BC. <clears throat> there is a school of thought that argues could have been even a lot later than that. Uh, the split between Goidelic, that is Irish, and Britonic, which becomes Welsh, may have only occurred 2000 years ago, <clears throat> about AD 100. When you compare the Alm inscriptions and the Gaulish inscriptions, for words in which you have got them on, on inscriptions in both areas and where they are clearly cognate, related to each other, they are remarkably similar, as you can see from this list here. So I get list you the Yom, the Gaulish. Uh, don't be too fussed by the exact endings because the, the Yom inscriptions so generally are in the genitive case, a different case than necessarily in, in, in the Gaulish. And I also give you the reconstructed forms that go back to supposedly Proto-Celtic, and which is very close to these. When we take a look at these lists and see how similar they are, and it not only includes just individual words, but even personal names. I list at the bottom there, for example, uh, that in, in both Ireland and Gaul, a person could carry a personal name, meaning dog head, Kunakeni in Ireland, or Kunopenis in Gaul. In Ireland, Gaul, in Iberia, you could carry the same name, Lug's servant or Meadborn. And these are personal names that have been carried through. The important thing about this is that we are suggesting on genetic evidence that Proto-Celtic goes back to the beakers at around 2500 BC. We're intercepting Gaulish, let's say, at 100 BC, Ulm at about 400 to 700 AD. This is remarkably similar for languages separated by two and a half to 3,000 years. One would not have expected this level of similarity. Take a look at the differences, for example, even among the modern Romance languages. This is the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. And I give it to you in Latin, so that you have a distance between Latin uh, and the beginnings of the Romance languages around 800 to 1000 AD, or the current uh, production of the, of, the, uh, of the Romance languages since the, the, the occurrence of Romance, seen in the comparison of Spanish or French. Or if you want to come closer to home, other than prepositions and pronouns, which I've tried to indicate, maybe the odd verb that I've tried to indicate here in red, how much of the opening of Beowulf, and you're only about a thousand years away from it in English, can you understand? When was the last time you fremadoned Ellen? <laughs> or anything else here? Uh, and consequently, it has changed so much in that time. And think back then at Gaulish and Irish, after 3,000 years, 
how similar they still seem to have been. So the question then is, do we still need later migrations to account for the similarity of Gaulish and primitive Irish? In other words, do we set the clock at 2500 BC or were there later invasions that we have not yet recovered within R1B that would tell us when the Irish language came in? Yes. <laughs> uh, I need to look. I can end this here, and that would take you to the end, or you might prefer some questions. I'm going to look at you, and you're going to signal to me what to do. Okay. Is, how much more do you have to do, do you think? I'll be talking fast. <laughs> Talk fast. You may have one or two questions. <clears throat> If there is a later invasion, <clears throat> it's going to be a small one, right? It cannot be something that completely changed the Irish uh, male genome, uh, as you've previously seen. Otherwise, we'd certainly have seen that. So it's going to be smaller migration. So how would a smaller migration come into this milieu and change the language of, of, of Ireland? And for this, what you need to know is, is basically how language shift occurs. How does a smaller language uh, infiltrate a society and, and spread? And so this is a quick model. We have here an island. Irish has not yet been introduced. They are speaking the red language, and they speak it in all of their social domains. And the social domains is it, a concept in, in, in linguistics. You can certainly understand this. Uh, one individual, the Emperor Charles V, is reputed to have spoken Spanish to God, French to his soldiers, Italian to his women, and German to his horse. Uh, each one of those represented a, a different social domain. Or talk about a Mumbai spice merchant who spoke Gujarati at home, speaks Kachi when he is in his own shop, but when he's buying spices in the general market, has to speak Marathi. If he climbs on a bus, he's going to be speaking Hindustani. But if he wants to take an international trip on a plane, he has to shift to English. All of those are different social domains. And the trick of the trade in spreading a language is that a target language, indicated here in blue, arrives and establishes some domestic, some settlers, and non-domestic social domains. There are certain areas in which their language will be particularly spoken. The Reds who are there will be attracted to the new social domains. And therefore, you can see a little bit of some of the social domains uh, spreading through Red territory there. The target language begins spreading across more and more social domains until ultimately you get societal bilingualism, where the target language is spoken in most of the non-domestic domains, and in some houses, previously red, they're grow letting their children grow up speaking blue instead. So the host society becomes bilingual. Reds are bilingual. Blues just shout louder. Ultimately, you get language death. Finally, you have in that one red house a grandmother, red grandmother, singing red lullabies to her uncomprehending blue grandchildren as her language dies <coughs> and the blues have replaced it. Now, <coughs> when you look at social domains in Ireland, throughout the prehistoric period, this is tricky because it's difficult to find too many different social domains because it has a dispersed settlement pattern. In other words, <clears throat> there has to be social domains. Boys have to meet girls somewhere. But by and large, it has the landscape that you still see today without the cities. Farms are individual. They'd be scattered across the landscape, separated by forests. So how in the world will a language spread in there. Where will the social domains, the new social domains occur? And when I wrote the book, and this is the, the theory 
I, I'm still clutching, even though the genetic evidence is, is against it, is that at about 1,000 BC, we now have over 105 known hill forts, and these are central places in Ireland. These are places where metallurgy occurs, where major ceremony occurs, things like that. They are the perfect vehicle for spreading a new language or encouraging bilingualism among a population that is completely dispersed. So that is still a theory uh, that, I, that I've, 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 I kind of like. The genetic evidence is running against it unless a more refined look at the, the R1B indicates something different. And the final thing that I will touch on is identity. I've talked about Irish genes and everything else, but when did the population of this island know they were Irish? Uh, and this, you know, for a prehistorian, what I'm about to do is impossible, but nevertheless, run with me. Uh, we have, from the early historical period, and it continues even today, uh, a concept that Ireland is divided up into five provinces, uh, the four traditional ones with Meath, which means the middle, the center. And it's part of what we'll call a political cosmology, almost a religious way of looking at how Ireland is organized, where each of the different provinces ruled by Tara in the center uh, are renowned for certain aspects, uh, Leinster for prosperity, uh, Connet for learning, uh, Munster for music, and no change there. <laughs> Ulster for, the, the key word is cough, battle, you know, and so that's what it's known for. Uh, a book that appeared some time ago by Nicholas Acheson regarding Armagh and the royal centers of early medieval Ireland argued that the Iron Age capitals of these provinces, of which we have excavated, or some evidence of excavation on, on all of them but, but Munster, uh, these Iron Age sites are really ceremonial. They're not residential or defensive capitals depicted in the in Irish tradition. And this whole concept of five province system, he argues, is built into the political ideology of the Enail, who were rising in the fifth century. They created this to convince the rest of Ireland that as they were the high kings of Ireland, all other kings of Ireland were below them and, and were owing to them. So this was to justify their political aspirations. And it was argued that this five province system could not lie in the prehistoric period because its ideological function in political context lies in the early medieval period. And this cosmological scheme could scarcely have developed without relating to the, well, basically the Enail ideology. But what in the world does this mean? When the Enail were trying to come up with, let's make a five province scheme and we'll put a capital in each one of them, they could have picked the henge monuments scattered all over. They could have picked the hill forts. They had 105 of them to choose for. Uh, a henge monument would be like the giant's ring. But of all the gin joints in Ireland, they picked the Iron Age monuments that carry the name of the capitals into the medieval period. That is just the way Irish tradition said they were. Be they the capital of Ulster at Navan, Old Irish Evan Maca or An Waka if you prefer, uh, or uh, Donaldina, the capital of Leinster, who have the same architecture uh, by and large uh, throughout two different periods. So why pick Iron Age ceremonial enclosures of a similar date or similar and similar morphology, same shape? You can only conclude that either the Enail spin doctors were also brilliant archaeologists who had access to ground-penetrating radar because all of these sites were completely overgrown by the period of the Enails, or Ireland did adopt a new political ideology in the first centuries BC. And if a whole island adopted the same overarching political ideology, 
that saw itself as an island occupied with a ruling center and four surrounding characteristic provinces, what you probably had then is the earliest concept of Ireland and the Irish. That lady saw <laughs> Thank you very much for a fabulous lecture. Um, we are a little bit over time, but I'm going to allow one or two questions from the audience. So questions for Jim? Any particular questions? Or just, uh, can Brad just go over here to avoid the... Uh, <coughs> sit down and have a... Uh, yes, the, your, your map is interesting. Uh, you haven't mentioned the Book of Invasions and the, what they first told us about the story and how that fits with the now evolved uh, theories. Is it, does it portray or... That's right. The reason why I haven't talked about that is because if I did, you wouldn't go out and buy my latest book, <laughs> In Search of the Irish Dreamtime, in which I take a closer look at the, the Lagwala and things like that. Uh, if you want to know, the Book of Invasions would say that the Irish began in Scythia, which is the area north of the Black Sea and then came through the Near East, through Egypt, etc. There were the children of Israel <laughs> that, came, that came at the parting of the sea. Children of Israel went across, the Irish went back, uh, <laughs> ultimately crossing all the way to, to Spain, and then of course from Spain seeing Ireland, and then the Sons of Mill sailed from there. Uh, to Ireland to take the land from the Tuatha Dé Danann, the, the previous occupants of it. Uh, and there are people who will say, my God, there is something in all of that. Because I've just given you a genetic one that begins in the area of Scythia, north of the Black and Caspian Seas, uh, and brought you with an origin you know, directly across Europe rather than the circuitous route. Unfortunately, it is only circumstantially the right answer because anybody writing at the time the Irish were dealing with this would be drawing their population from Scythia. Scythia was believed to be the area previously occupied by the sons of Japhet and when the sons of Noah divided up the world and Shem got the Semitic speaking, Ham got the Hamitic, everybody else was Japhetic, and that was north of the Black Sea. And therefore, the biblical explanation for the old origins of the Irish and Germans and everyone else would take you back to that same area. So I don't believe anything well, about the Irish. Well. A, a deep skeptic. Deep skeptic, <laughs> yes. I'm going to ask the last question. Um, Professor Dan Bradley, uh, whom you know very, very well, um, at the uh, ancient uh, genetic laboratory in Trinity College in Dublin, uh, did the analysis on the Ballymahatty and Rathlin Island uh, finds. He also has, he says, in the tens of uh, ancient uh, DNA samples from a variety of ancient archeological digs over the last several millennia, and those are being analyzed as we speak. So looking into the future for the third edition of your book in 2022, what do you think is going to happen when we have the new genetic data? I didn't set you up for this. <laughs> I would have imagined that in the future research, <laughs> first thing we need is genetic profile of female populations through time. And with larger samples, we should start getting that. The standard model regarding migrations is normally migrations are carried out by young males who take local females for wives before you get a genetic stream mm -hmm. of, 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 of local females. And whether that is so or not will be determined by some of whatever Dan is, is up to. Uh, second thing, absolutely critical, certainly for archaeologists, is knowing what is the contribution, the real contribution at the level of ancient DNA between the local population of Ireland who occupied Ireland from 8,000 to 4,000 BC to the Neolithic itself? 
because the big question is to what extent the Neolithic was a product of migration and basically the wiping out of local hunter-gatherer societies or to what extent local hunter-gatherer societies simply adopted uh, and adapted to, to a new economy and became the, the basic thing. That, I hope, will be settled by Diane's stuff. <coughs> and then we have all types of these other little invasions that once we now have the DNA studied, like Linkardstown Kiss or Middle Neolithic stuff or Grooved Wear, all of these things, we'll be able to see whether these are really just <coughs> movement of a cultural influence, diffusion, or are we going to be blindsided again? And the one that would get me least surprised about being blindsided, and I'm just going to skip through these real quick, is the one closest to home. <coughs> Before the beakers, I mentioned the grooved wear. The beakers, so far as we can see, in Ireland, they worked metals. No question about that. We have evidence of their mines, and beaker copper mines and things like that. But other than that, all they did was drop pot shirts on the ground or into pits. Uh, they didn't seem to build anything, uh, unless they were building the wedge tombs themselves and not just simply uh, using them from, from somebody else. The people before them, the grooved were, we don't know for sure who built the giant's frame. Since we're in Belfast, this is your closest you know, monument. Uh, however, just outside of it was an enormous timber structure, and that was built by the grooved ware people, and we find their, their monuments elsewhere in Ireland. They built big ceremonial complexes. They looked like they originally came from, from Scotland. Actually, the Orkneys tends to be the, the point of origin, and that surely would, would like to find out, do we have actually another transformation of, 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 of Ireland at that time or not? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, <coughs> please give a, a warm round of applause for Dr. Jim The next presentation here will be me in about five minutes, so I'll catch up on the time there. See you then. Thank you, Jim. That was brilliant. Right. Has that muted? Uh, let me just turn that off. There you go. You're free. Yes, um, right. Take that. <laughs> Rather than going, that was the moment I thought to say, that ought to be a little bastard. Uh, no, no, exactly. <laughs> just as it's broadcast on you. That, that <laughs> yeah. was done on a children's program in America in the 1930s. Oh, was it really? Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. The favorite clipper. Fine. Well, uh, thank you so much for that. I'm okay. going to set up my next presentation. Do you want to um, take these guys outside and yes. ask questions? And that's it. Right. Now. Well, that was very tactful of you. I've had a word with Martin. Uh huh. And he's going to organize a trip around Prony. Let me just do this, because um, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll have to talk to you. Uh, I cannot uh, focus on several things at the same time. Um, and I think I might have just ruined his uh, present. Ah, oh, genealogy is there. Right, OK. So I need this, and I need NG2. And that is going to go up now, and I have to go to the loo. So huh? I will be back in two minutes. I'll come with you. Ah. Yeah, work. Ah.